motion sa iyo. But uh, again, thank you for everyone. Um, we've been uh, in a part of the workshop so far. Uh, this is truly my personal exciting moment of the workshop because uh, I'm fortunate to hear a lot of these topics, you know, multiple times in the month. So I get a lot of this. Uh, what I don't get is a panelist like this. You know, today we are extremely fortunate to have, uh, you know, four of the most prolific uh, innovators, ecosystem uh, uh, leaders of the Qatar uh, region joining us. Uh, in no particular order, but I'd like to uh, introduce, uh, you know, the ladies first. Uh, Omeida Nadim, uh, she's the founder of uh, Purple Box Qatar. Um, Rata Zazur, uh, she is the acting CEO of Derby Health. Um, Dr. Tejinder Singh, uh, founder of Q-Tickets, uh, also the director of the Startup Grind Doha chapter. Uh, and Sayed Taukir, who is the... Um, investment officer from the Qatar Development Bank. First of all, to all the panelists, thank you so much for taking your time uh, and being with us today. You know, we've got a fantastic group of entrepreneurs who are part of this workshop. And I think um, your views uh, and, uh, and your, uh, you know, your inspiration is much needed. Um, and I think when, I, when we looked at what, what would be the best topic, you know, uh, for this panel discussion, uh, you know, we zeroed on, on a topic which was pretty much, I think, every Qatari could, uh, you know, could uh, could associate himself or herself with. You know, 5th June 2017 seems like I don't know. For some people, it seems like long uh, time from now. But some people, it just seems like it was yesterday. That was a true defining moment of Qatar in many ways, like the resilience, uh, you know, and 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 the fight for new opportunities, the fight for a new way of life, which everybody is facing across the world today. Uh, you guys have been doing it for the last two years and you guys have been doing it very, very successful. So resilience and fighting uh, the new norms is something that is uh, not very, uh, you know, old to, uh, you know, the Qatari region. So I think it's a very befitting topic to have today, uh, resilience during the crisis and creating opportunities. I once again, thank you all the panelists for taking the time to be with us. Uh, could we start with, you know, everyone making a quick introduction about themselves, their organization, so that the audience can, uh, you know, uh, can know something more about yourself. I know that you guys are stars in your own right, but it'll be good for a, a few others who probably don't know you as well. So uh, again, in no particular order, we could let the ladies go first to introduce themselves uh, before we go into the actual panel. Okay. Uh, uh, Roger, you could start uh, our... Yeah, I can, I can start, yeah. No problem. Thank you so much, Mohsin, and thank you, uh, QE Tech, for the opportunity. It's uh, great to be with uh, this team panel. My name is Huayda Nadim. Uh, I am uh, uh, the, uh, the owner and the founder of uh, Purple Box. It's an e-commerce uh, platform. It's a traditional marketplace. I have been in the technology sphere uh, for a long time. Uh, it's my passion, and at the same time, I'm observant of uh, the landscape of e-commerce in the country. Uh, I also have a PR firm uh, specialized mainly in strategic communication and PR. Thank you, Weda. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Rasha Barzur and I'm the acting CEO of Druby Health Technology. Uh, Druby is a Qatari company. We are uh, leaders in the digital therapeutic solution world for uh, chronic disease and wellness in the MENA region. Uh, we offer digital programs to manage chronic disease and build wellness. And using this new technologies, data analysis, uh, digital analytics, and artificial uh, intelligence, and real remote health coaches, we modify users' behaviors aiming for uh, long-term clinical and behavioral outcomes. Thank you, Racha. Appreciate it. Dr. Singh. Uh, hi, um, uh, good evening to everyone and thank you Kiwi for uh, inviting me. So I've been a serial entrepreneur. I have uh, been a founder of Q-Tickets, which is uh, listed on this panel uh, as, my, as my founding venture. Uh, beside this, I've been instrumental in setting up uh, 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 you know, call centers, uh, BPOs, uh, been uh, instrumental in setting up a lot of digital assets, digital platform, predominant around technology. Uh, assets in e-commerce, uh, but Q-Ticket has been one uh, formidable venture in Qatar that has grown up in the last five, six years. 
and has uh, positioned itself as one of the successful ventures all across the region. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Over to Talkir. Uh, thank you, Mohsin. I'd just like to start off with uh, thanking you and Kiwi Tech for giving me the opportunity to be part of this wonderful panel. Uh, my name is Talkir, and I'm working as an investment officer for the Qatar Development Bank. Uh, as most of you are aware of, QDB is a major player when it comes to development in Qatar. Uh, we are managing a technology-based venture capital fund that does both uh, direct equity inv investments in uh, SMEs as well as indirect investments in international venture capital funds as part of our fund of funds program. Uh, before QDB, I worked in various roles where I've invested and helped scale small and medium enterprises to make them internationally competitive. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you panelists for the introduction. So uh, just to kind of give you a, a couple of housekeeping rules for everyone. Um, we have about four questions for the panelists. Uh, you know, each panelist will uh, take about a minute to answer and respond. Uh, we also want absolute involvement from all the guests. So uh, if you have any specific questions to anyone or to the panelists across the board, uh, you can message your questions to either me, Donna or Murtaza, the other moderators or to add. So if anybody has any questions, please send it over uh, to us um, after our first set of four questions. Uh, we'll definitely want the audience set of questions to be responded by our panelists. Now, as an opening question uh, to all the panelists, um, we all know, you know, what we're going through. Uh, you know, we also know that COVID-19 has kind of shaken up the entire startup ecosystem. There's a lot of uncertainties. Uh, there is optimism, there is hope, but there's also a lot of uncertainties. So I want your opening suggestions to the startup entrepreneurs out there, especially from the Qatar region who have, you know, who have joined us, you know, mostly today. Uh, like, how do they how do they navigate this this you know uncertain, unprecedented times? Your opening suggestions, uh, and again, I'll let anyone take the uh, you know the, take the first uh, cut at it, and then we'll move on from uh, one panelist to the other. I can I can take the lead motion on this. Sure, talk to you. Go ahead. Uh, so I think uh, venture-backed startups are especially vulnerable in, in a time uh, like this where, where we are uh, almost near a recession. And in addition to the, to the overall drop in demand, I think startups are unlikely to have a significant revenue base. Uh, so I, I think there are some key points I'd like to highlight here first, and uh, it, it's very important to, to actually implement this. Uh, and it's, it's an obvious thing, but difficult to actually enforce is that founders must not panic and, and they must take precautions to, to have a clear and calm mind when making decisions. Uh, the second thing is that uh, this, this calm mindset is, is very important when you're communicating with your employees. So not only do you have to have to give them the tools necessary to stay productive from home, but also build up their motivation and communicate transparently with them on, on what the business is going through and what's your outlook. The other thing is that I, I think uh, it, the, the startup should be, should be focused on, on survival rather than growth in these times. So I, I think it would be a wise move to just reach out to your existing customer base and engage with them and give them your 100% when it comes to uh, fulfilling uh, your service contracts with them, rather than chasing new customers, which is, which is not the wisest move in, in this time. Uh, from an operational standpoint, I think conserving cash. Cash is king usually for startups, but in, in these uh, times, I think it's especially important to conserve cash. You should reduce your operating expenditure, delay any capital expenditures that you have in mind, and, and lastly, I think this is a very good time for introspection for all entrepreneurs. You should take this time to evaluate and reassess your business models, review your, the competitive landscape, and, and draw up new forecasts for the future. Uh, uh, one, one final point is that uh, you should uh, check to see if you qualify for any government support measures. In, in these times. And there are a lot of state agencies rolling these uh, support measures out. So just see and uh, make full use of them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Very valuable points. Um, I would invite any of the panelists uh, next to go, please. Okay, Rachel, I can you go next. 
Yes, sure, I can go next. Um, I'm not gonna uh, repeat uh, Takir's points because definitely they're very uh, valuable, but I'm I just wanna say what we have done basically at Druby Health is that uh, in response to this COVID-19, which is a global crisis, but more particularly to Qatar, what we have done is we have developed, let's say a COVID application. So something tailored to what is needed right now. So developed a COVID application without uh, basically putting a lot of money or resources into the development, but something that is very much needed right now. So focused on basically the solutions that are required now, the SCOVI uh, application is um, basically just uh, offering the prevention, the awareness, uh, all the uh, needed preventative measures uh, that should be shared with everyone, mostly the migrant workers who are at a high risk of contracting COVID-19. So that, this way we can help contain and mitigate the problem and at the same time make the best out of these new opportunities. That's one thing. The other thing that we have done is basically just tailor the services that we have to what is needed right now. So for example, we know that the safety of both clients or patients and healthcare provider is needed. So kind of using more the digital health management, the digital healthcare delivery, something that will uh, apply right now to the quarantine sites, to the chronic disease, to the awareness, the high-risk identification, all that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Raja. Uh, thank you so much for the response. Uh, Umida, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. No problem. Uh, I think the, the best thing, this is an opportunity. I look at uh, COVID-19, I think it's really presented an opportunity immediately after the blockade because uh, we have seen that there are some businesses, uh, for example, like the e-commerce, uh, since that's an area I'm familiar with, it has really uh, it's sky, uh, the, it's spurred a lot of demand and probably skyrocketed for a lot of the companies uh, here in Qatar. Most of our e-commerce providers uh, and players were not even ready for this. Uh, they were immediately felt like, okay, there is a huge spur of demand. Some of them were already uh, went silent or probably sleep uh, for the last six months because of the lack of demand uh, in e-commerce. And all of a sudden, we're realizing that they're coming up with. I think for entrepreneurs, whether they are in this field or other fields, they need to look into the gaps. There is a lot of white spaces here in Qatar. Uh, the, the ecosystem of, the, of, e of uh, startup is maturing, maybe at the institution's level but not at the level of the entrepreneurs themselves. Still, we are having people coming up with the same ideas, with the same concept. We're still copying the same models. And uh, that's why we will see a lot of uh, duplication uh, in a lot of the, uh, of the companies that they're coming and they don't last. And even if those who are lasting, those are probably have some sort of institutional backing. But when it came to scalability, you find that a startup is staying there for a long time, a five year and it's still a startup. So they don't even mature to the SME level. Uh, they, there is a lot of provisions for a startup right now. It is captured that opportunity. However, look for the gaps. What is the white space that you can really take an opportunity of it? We were so happy to see that, for example, the Ministry of Commerce for the first time when they defined the, the, the vital services that need to be kept uh, during the, the lockdown was e-commerce was one of them. This is the first time that we have seen it and it was really, uh, for me, at least, it was, uh, it made me smile. It made me feel like, okay, at least what you are doing is right. However, we need to differentiate because we noticed that most of the e-commerce players coming into the market, they want to be Amazon from day one, which is impossible. It, you need to differentiate. You need to specialize. You need to look into what customers you are trying to serve. And at the same time, what kind of products you need to deal with because your supply chain is changing dramatically as a result of this crisis. Mira, thank you so much. Fantastic points. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Singh, uh, over to you for uh, you know, uh, the final remarks on this question. Yeah, I think uh, uh, you know, uh, largely all the points have been touched, but I would emphasize on three things that probably is the need of the hour. One is uh, what Tofik mentioned is the cash. Uh, how much you can reserve, you can preserve your reserves and uh, you, you, know, you can actually uh, have to save your fuel. You have to understand, uh, you know, this is a period which is going to, I mean, nobody knows the end of this, you know, it, it's just a, it's just a speculation, two months, three months, some says four months, some people says one and a half months, two months, maybe. But I think by the time the whole, uh, world will come back, it's going to take some time and we all have to be very, very patient on this. Uh, secondly is, uh, the balancing act between preserving your uh, resources or the cash is to take care of your team, which you have built up over the period of years. 
Now, this is one of the most difficult challenges for an entrepreneur. You have built up a team, you have hired the skills, you have trained them, you have uh, you know modulated them into your culture, your uh, space, and now suddenly you have to uh, you can't afford them to lose. You know, uh, you can't lose them, and for this you have to uh, you know keep them with you, in the hope that you will come back again. But that hope is still uh, undefined. You know. So that becomes a big challenge, and uh, like uh, uh, like uh, Ms. Nadim said, the opportunity is there. So with every uh, uh, situation, there is an opportunity that we have. So uh, there are a lot of opportunities in the tech space or in the non-tech space that Qatar has or will have, or this region largely would have. Uh, but I think the 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 precedence has been to copy what others are doing. So if they were about uh, two delivery companies in Qatar. Now, probably we have about, uh, you know, almost one and a half dozen. So everyone seems to be delivering, you know, uh, it's a need of the hour undoubtedly, but that's not sustainable model in such a small market. So people have to think differently. And this is where I think the startup should, uh, uh, you know, play a very important role in terms of coming up with new ideas. So I think uh, your uh, uh, cash, your team and the opportunity are the three things that, you know, probably you have to focus on in this period of time. I think fantastic points. I think all very, uh, you know, well articulated as well as, you know, like uh, with a lot of reason. Uh, and I think I'm going to pick this one from, uh, you know, uh, Racha's statement about how Ruby Health is doing, uh, you know, in the, in the midst of this COVID-19. But I would also like to know from uh, the rest of the panelists that how is your organization, uh, you know, helping uh, the startup, all the entrepreneurs, uh, in Qatar during this crisis time, you know, like, you know, I know that QDB has a few things going on. I know Dr. Singh, you're involved, uh, mentoring a lot of startup entrepreneurs in, in your business as well. Uh, so like uh, each one of the panelists to share, how is their organization helping the startup entrepreneurs during this crisis? So I'll take a lead on this. Uh, what we have done here is that we, uh, uh, we had our team and we had a whole infrastructure which uh, uh, because of queue tickets being ticketing in the entertainment industry has come to a halt. So what we did was we diversified our resources into delivery and that too for free of cost for the entire country. So we initiated a service more on a social cause and we started helping startups. So we will be very soon, uh, you know, helping uh, uh, farmers market fresh, uh, which is a startup done by one of our colleagues uh, in Qatar, uh, you know, uh, on the, on the groceries. And we are helping the people get their uh, pharmacies, medicine requirements, uh, groceries at home. So we are trying to help other startups who want the deliveries. And we, on the same side, we are also helping the society by doing it absolutely free of cost. So this is the kind of investment that we have done uh, for the people to, uh, you know, uh, not step out and, you know, create, be safe at their home and, uh, you know, absolutely be uh, conscious about not stepping out and, you know, distancing yourself. So, uh, yeah, this is what we have done. And we are parallelly thinking about other opportunities that we could actually uh, bring it up in the times to come, which could include, which would include, you know, uh, centric around technology enabled services uh, for the people that people don't have to. So we do not know the end of this uh, hope, as I said, we do not know whether it's going to be two months, three months, but I'm very much sure that it's going to be a long, long time before the world comes back to what it was in December last. And uh, uh, during this period, there's a lot of time to think, a lot of time to uh, change yourself. And I think this is uh, what is forcing us to think on the things that we would bring it on. Singh, Dr. Singh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for what you're doing. I really appreciate it. Anybody wants to go next? Well, I can go next. Uh, actually, I'm not doing a specific uh, direct uh, support to the entrepreneurs per se. Uh, because we are a small company as well, and we are also overwhelmed uh, with what happened uh, with the COVID-19 uh, in the sense that we feel ourselves or find that ourselves are bombarded as well with a lot of uh, orders and requests. So we have to manage the business more than, than anything, which is a good problem to have, to be frankly speaking. Uh, but what I, what I do is mostly uh, is I share a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas, a lot of information about the e-commerce landscape in Qatar in my, in my LinkedIn. Maybe that's not that much to say, but actually part of what, we, what I read, what I analyze, I try to share as much as possible information in order to help people at least to have uh, the right kind of information available about Qatar and the e-commerce landscape in Qatar. I feel like uh, information is, uh, is something very important because people, they keep still uh, asking the same questions, they keep repeating the same models, 
they keep returning to the same suppliers. I mean, so there is a lot of repetitions going on. But I think by sharing, we know what is happening. And then people by then, after that, they can start to differentiate. Uh, being knowledgeable of the landscape in Qatar, I think it's very important. And uh, it, will be, it will be very good if a lot of people start sharing their experiences at least. Because that, that I think in Qatar, which is the missing, it's not a question of the, yes, the cash is an issue maybe, but uh, the government has been doing a lot of help and support for the SMEs and probably I assume even for the startup. So, but information, the lack of information is the key issue that we are all struggling with. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Um, Talkir, I'm pretty sure that uh, a lot of are expecting a lot from QDB during this time. So, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, sorry to put you in the spot. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we are, uh, I think, one of the biggest stakeholders when it comes to uh, the SME ecosystem in Qatar, and we have certainly uh, taken a proactive role. And I'd just like to uh, connect this with the last point I made in, in the earlier question of uh asking everyone to see if they support for any of these programs that i'm about to mention so so the a major program uh, uh, that has been launched by qdb recently is the covid 19 guarantee response program so that is actually a new product that can be availed by Qatri smes and what it does it uh, qdb issues a hundred percent guarantee for loans taken out by the private sector companies to pay rent and salaries for three months so uh, as, as you are aware of that, uh, rent and salaries are major uh, expense line items for almost all SMEs. So this will greatly reduce the operating expenditure burden for companies in the short term. Uh, the repayment period will be three years and there's a one year grace period. We have a dedicated uh, phone line at our bank and you are, all of you are free to you know, contact and uh, get more information on this. Uh, we have made a partnership with all commercial and Islamic banks for providing the product. So just uh, get in touch with your relevant uh, banking partner as well. The next thing that we are doing is we are going to have the first COVID-19 hackathon as a response to this crisis. So the purpose will be to help local innovators and entrepreneurs generate, uh, generate innovative solutions. Uh, with the help of QDB as well as our strategic partners. Uh, there are uh, three or four areas that are covered, which are protecting the vulnerable populations, supporting the healthcare system, preventing the spread of the virus, and finally, uh, unlocking the supply chain. So if you, have, uh, if you guys have any good ideas around these topics, uh, please do apply. Uh, lastly, I think uh, more specifically when it comes to investments, we are uh, actively helping our portfolio companies weather out this storm, uh, which, which includes giving uh, strategic and operational guidance. And then there are uh, a couple of buckets that we have put the startups in, in uh, like uh, one bucket is where it has minimum impact on, on existing uh, companies, which are, uh, for, for example, early stage or still in product development. And then, and then there is another bucket, which, which is uh, severely affected. And then uh, some companies are actually beneficiaries of, uh, as, as uh, uh, like e-commerce players are actually beneficiaries of this crisis. So we are assessing uh, which of them would need financial support or additional help that we can provide. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. And, and I think, you know, to uh, give a lot of credit to QDB, you know, I've, I've uh, kind of known your team and, you know, like an entire folks at QDB for almost a year now. I mean, you guys stand out in terms of transparency. And I feel like it's like, sometimes it's very difficult when the information, you know, sometimes it makes me wonder, like, can the information be that transparent, <laughs> that open, you know, where, where, you know, but then you guys have always, you know, stood apart as an, as an agency that is, very clear, it's, it's everything is out there for everybody to know. It, it, it creates very little, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, a lack of information or misrepresentation of information. So thank you again for all that you guys continue to do. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, Raj, I know you've touched upon uh, a few things, but love to know a little bit more on uh, Druby Health as well, if, uh, if you have yeah. anything more to add. 
Yes. So just a couple of comments. As I mentioned, uh, we did launch the Kobe app, which is more for the coronavirus. But I would like to say that also uh, we did that free of charge, but in collaboration with uh, our um, other startups and entrepreneurs in Qatar, we were able to distribute it. So I would like to, to thank uh, Dr. Dr. Singh for Q tickets, for example, for uh, working with us on that. Uh, definitely, the we seek endorsement from uh, the Ministry of Public Health, we seek to support from different uh, from different uh, uh, public entities like the Supreme Committee for uh, Delivery and Legacy. So we tried to, to basically um, uh, get some support and endorsement from different parties, but at the same time offer our services free of charge for the community as part of our community contribution, but at the same time to just make it easier for, um, for the clinics and for the uh, enterprises and the uh, employers to distribute this amongst their, their employees. Um, that's the first part. And again, as I said, for um, the, uh, the remote uh, health management, we made it more available for clinics, for uh, the Ministry of Public Health, for Hamad uh, Medical Corporation, for PHCC. So we did offer uh, the services that we have, even if it's for, with a very, very minimal cost or just a free of charge so that they can uh, benefit from the platforms that we have in order to get... Um, uh, to get the services delivered remotely. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Racha. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, we all have been talking about this crisis is going to bring in new opportunities, uh, which is fantastic. But uh, I think it'll be good also for the entrepreneurs to know is um, the panelists here, what, what do you think are some of the new opportunities that the entrepreneurs should look into is there, you know, is there a way to prepare? Because many of them are first time entrepreneurs. They might not have had, you know, yes, they probably have gone through different crises, but not this kind. So how do they prepare for it to make sure that this crisis turning out into new opportunities can be leveraged? Uh, so any words of advice would be great. So uh, I can take the lead, Mosin. Uh, I think uh, in the current time, uh, everyone focus is on uh, healthcare and supply chain. But, um, you know, uh, overall, I believe uh, that's going to be uh, until this period ends. After this, I believe the, the period would more focus, I mean, the period that we will face would be more on, uh, uh, you know, digital. So what will happen in this period of uh, four, five, six months or whatever it is, people will get habitual to uh, the digital uh, acceptance, you know, the adaptability. So like we are doing now uh, uh, something which, uh, which probably would have come to Qatar and done it in some ballroom with all the people around and we being on the stage, sitting on the chairs in front of the audience. We are today doing this in, uh, uh, on a Zoom. So, uh, you know, uh, so we are also adapting to it. You know, we are adapting to it and we are finding it. Uh, this is not bad, actually. The, the whole uh, setup is not bad and we can always do this. Uh, so we are all adopting the digital part, you know, uh, whether we are buying something, whether we are uh, talking to our doctors, whether we are, uh, you know, the kids are studying in the school, they're doing the digital. So they've become the champions on Zoom now, more than us. They've become pros on this thing. So, so all of these guys, you know, the entire community, the entire segment is getting adapted to it, you know. So uh, you know, doctors are getting adapted to talking to the, uh, the patients and, uh, you know, talking to them on symptoms. So all of this is going digital. So I think this, by the time this period is over, the larger section of the population will become habitual of using the digital part and which actually throws a great opportunity for us to think every opportunity converted into a digital. And this is where I think the future would be. This would take this particular turning point in the world will take people to adopting digital uh, uh, as, as a tool to uh, convert the opportunity or to convert the opportunity into a service, into a product, into a, a, a serviceability. And I think that would be the future. So I would say it is not related to healthcare. It could be anywhere. It could be in education. It could be supply chain. It could be healthcare. It could be logistics. Um, it could be entertainment. It could be uh, even call centers. I mean, today you, you hire huge spaces in terms of rentals, you know, and uh, you are putting 2000 people in, under one roof to attend the calls for various retail or healthcare. Now today in the COVID times, everybody is at home. So we have now customized our own, I'm giving my example. We have customized now, on, now our own software, which actually enables uh, our call center agent to sit from home and answer the calls. So, you know, the whole business model is changing. 
So the whole cost price, this would actually bring the cost price down in terms of having no rentals and people sitting at home and adapting to digital thing. So, I mean, I probably feel it may not be completely a conversion site, but yes, a large, uh, large part of digital would, you know, step into our lives and people would become prefer this more. So the life will get now more concentrated on mobile and technology than it used to be. Great. Thank you. I, I can, I, I can follow on. Sure, sure. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I will, I will follow you. Don't worry. All right. Uh, so, so just to, I think I, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Tijinder and I, I think that there is a paradigm shift uh, taking place in terms of how we live, how we work, how we consume. Uh, so definitely uh, we, we will see this uh, virus acting as a catalyst for the digitalization of the SMEs in Qatar and uh, Spur e-commerce. Uh, it's, uh, it's still a nascent, uh, uh, it's, it's still a nascent sector compared to uh, other regions. So it's a high opportunity space and we have yet to see, uh, you know, good innovation in it because uh, as uh, previous panelists mentioned, there are certainly uh, a lot of copy paste models in this space. Then the other obvious beneficiary is obviously, obviously the health tech and uh, wellness space. Uh, I think VCs will also like to see uh, enterprise startups that offer long-term uh, uh, SaaS contracts and easy remote onboarding. So retail transactional businesses uh, will definitely have uh, somewhat of a hard time uh, finding investors uh, given the massive slowdown in consumer activity. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's also important to realize that it's perfectly all right if you do not come across an idea specifically pertaining to sectors that will be impacted in the short term. So as again, Dr. Tizinja put it, uh, uh, and I'd like to add uh, from, a, from an investor point of view that investors and funds are usually focused on long-term strategy. And while they do some deals based on short-term events, our core investment thesis remains pretty much the same in the long term. So if you have a good business model that is scalable in the long run, you should definitely continue to back it up. Uh, lastly, I think another opportunity uh, is, is it, this is a great time for personal development. And as I mentioned earlier, refining your golden ideas. Uh, a lot of people used to complain earlier that they, the day-to-day -day grind was inhibiting their clarity and creativity. So I think uh, COVID now has uh, put the brakes on for all of us. And there has never been a better time to really think things through. And you should use this period to further innovate and improve your products and services and uh, building your IP. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Ohira, uh, on to you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think what the, what the gentleman said is absolutely right. But I think what has happened uh, over the last uh, couple of months, I think is uh, the institutions and the customers, I think uh, digitization has won the trust of both sides. And that's very important. No, people were you, losing, looking at it as a luxury. Now they know it is a necessity. Okay. To have a real uh, digitization in place is become part of your national security, is part of your growth, is part of your scalability. Uh, yes, differentiation is important. Uh, you take e-commerce, you take supply chain. Yes, this is the traditional ones. Innovation is there to happen. However, uh, it is very important that also the institutions, uh, like uh, the QDB, like the banks, uh, like uh, all the supporters of the startups and the SMEs, they need to start thinking about, in a market like other, what is scalable and what is not. We need to really think, uh, think and look at it with a lot of insight. It's an opportunity for also, the, since, let's say, as Dr. Stan said, there are dozens of uh, e-commerce platforms. It's time for merge and acquisition. It's time for integration in terms for uh, real uh, companies start looking at each other and seeing how they can complement each other and can grow. No matter what we say, we used to say Qatar is a very small market. Well, this, this problem now indicated to us, yes, it is a small market, but there are, when there is a crisis, there is a real demands for good caliber of companies, of factories, of uh, plants to deliver. Okay, and we had an issue like everybody else in the world with the issues of disinfectants, with uh, the masks, with uh, uh, sanitizers and in Qatar we have three or four uh, factories at the beginning they were struggling to meet the, the local demand okay now they have transferred some of their supply lines in order to produce uh, masks and to produce uh, sanitizers to meet the local demands of the market so 
it is there is more role has to be done into the or institutions like has to be played by institutions like UGB. It's not only about fun and luxury and playing hackathon and we're trying to support entrepreneurs and so forth. It's startup by startup, but you need to help them to scale. Otherwise, what is going to be their contribution to the economy? Okay, so this is they have to look really with a very close eye with a lot of insight and looking at the interest of what these companies need because they need to localize a lot of the supply chain in the country. Great, fantastic. I mean, thank you so much. Um, and then this is the last question to the panelists because I have a ton of questions coming in from the, uh, from the audience that I want to keep some time for. Uh, now, we all know that a startup ecosystem is about investors, incubators, state agencies. They all have very, very crucial roles to support the entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, and their businesses during this crisis. Now, uh, to the panelists, what have you seen uh, as some examples that you know, you would think that the Qatar startup ecosystem or some of the Qatar agencies need to emulate, you know, basically where can we do better? What are some of those uh, shining examples that you see that you would like to happen in Qatar as well? Mahsen, can I just touch a little bit on the previous question since I didn't get my uh, role to answer? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> you, you get you get two questions in a row. I'm sorry. I get to do two in one. Okay, great. So uh, just from a digital health perspective, I just want to say that probably here in Qatar, we were a little bit behind in the, using the telemedicine and the video uh, medicine. So uh, I guess this pandemic has presented an unexpected opportunity to embrace the digital health solutions in the healthcare system, especially that here we were relying a lot on the in-hospital visits, putting people that suffer from chronic disease at risk. So I guess uh, this has been a great opportunity to implement digital health uh, solutions and I guess integrate it with the hospital systems and with the clinic systems, not only just offer it on a short period of time, but have it integrated in there. That could uh, definitely help with the numbers of users seen, but at the same time with uh, the scalability for uh, healthcare providers. But as for your second, uh, your, your fourth question, um, definitely we need uh, um, we need those organizations and groups and, uh, and even uh, the government to be a catalyst in helping uh, the current situation with the use of technology. Uh, we need definitely to help them, we need them to help us uh, make it more uh, realistic, uh, make it do the development needed, especially in this time of COVID-19 where everything is a little bit restricted. Uh, especially planning uh, the finances for the next few months. Um, definitely supporting financially the startups, uh, making programs that will allow us to continue our development and uh, keep our team on board uh, while we are um, meeting our goal and uh, reaching our um, target. Thank you, you Racha. And again, my apologies for missing you on the previous one. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. So anybody next on the on the response of you know like some examples that you're seeing that you would like you know uh, Qatar to follow or some of the new things that you would like to see happen in Qatar? Well, for me, I can just give a simple example. I, I wouldn't say that it is an example internationally, but when whenever I hear uh, the go the governor of New York talking every day in his press briefing, I mean calling on startups and SMEs and companies to come and help and provide. Uh, uh, basically what is missing, I mean, uh, for most of their, uh, in, in New York, particularly in the healthcare center, sector, sorry. I think this is exactly uh, what, what, is, what is needed. I mean, it is basically uh, a call has to be given based on real need uh, for, the, uh, for the startups and for the SMEs to help them to identify what is really it is needed in the country to help them to modify and differ differentiate it. Because at the beginning, in the first session, you said that entrepreneurship is lonely. Everybody will think of an idea and will think, well, this is idea is going to fly and I will do it and I will, be, I will do it different than the others until they get to the market and then face the reality. So it is, I think that, I'm not saying hand-holding, it's not about creativity and hand-holding, but it is actually help them to show them the direction, what is really needed, and based on that, they can build. Because that's a way of helping them also to sustain. And uh, it is also important that once they get sustained, they will be able to grow and find it and they might differentiate or they might drop the whole idea. But I think looking at international models, yes, I think to me, regardless of the problems that they are facing, but uh, New York is a good example to look at and how they are trying to solve a lot of the problems. Thank you so much, Oveda. Talk here. Uh, 
So, so I think the playbook generally across the world for uh, for most countries is uh, is two pronged. But uh, I, I think it's, it's it's fiscal stimulus and and monetary policy, right? So I think monetary policy has reached its limits and interest rates around the world are almost close to zero. So I think fiscal stimulus is is the major tool right now. And uh, for us as well, I think the the Qatari government has been uh, doing a good job. It's it's uh, it's being uh, playing a proactive role. In, uh, and the response has been timely and focused to aid SMEs. I think the need is to make sure the startup spectrum from incubation to investment uh, receives uh, adequate attention and there are no gaps. Uh, in all likelihood, I think the COVID-19 uh, situation marks the advent of a buyer's market in, in private equity and venture capital. However, I think it, uh, in general, investors uh, should should not you know uh, over leverage this advantage uh, and come up with unfair terms uh, or overburdening terms for companies looking to raise capital in in this uh, difficult time. Uh, lastly, I think stakeholders should keep in mind both long and short term implications. Uh, uh, for for example, again, while some sectors will warrant increased focus during the crisis, it uh, is not necessary again that they will see sustained traction in the long run. So I think uh, decision making. Uh, for both uh, for both government support as well as uh, private sector engagement should involve a holistic approach. Thank you, um, Dr. Tajinder. Um, do you have anything to add? I feel that uh, uh, you know, as uh, uh, you know, the other panelists have mentioned, it is right that you know at this time your whole thought process whole thought process has changed you know you are looking at opportunities which are uh, uh, which were missing while we were running uh, a, a normal uh, you know life pre covid and now we see that there are a lot of opportunities in digital space that probably and as i earlier said also that the whole uh, paradigm shift will come towards uh, using digital as your enabler for uh, you know various services uh, supply chain uh, you know uh, opportunities problems so you will see digital stepping into all of these things. And I think in this time, as an investor entrepreneur, probably I will look at uh, myself, look at the startups which are promising in times to come, especially in the digital space uh, to invest. I would look at uh, the ideas that are uh, fantastic. They are very sparky in terms of, uh, you know, capturing the niche space, uh, particularly the blue ocean concepts rather than the red ocean concept. And uh, that would be the need of the uh, future, I believe. And there are a lot of there are there's still a lot of space which is still uh, untouched by digital uh, you know uh, uh, evolution in this part of the world especially I would not say uh, US or UK but yes this part of the world and uh, I think this is this is uh, this is uh, uh, an opportunity basically to look at uh, the opportunities that would uh, or the the the, uh, the the opportunity that would be there for the next many years to come. And this is probably as an entrepreneur, as an investor, I would look at. Thank you so much. Uh, I've got a ton of questions, so I want to keep uh, mindful of that. And Allah. Okay, the first question um, is, uh, <clears throat> this is first uh, to Racha. Uh, Racha, in, you have a digital health uh, in a startup, Druby. Uh, how did you get prepared to take on the sudden spike in demand and you know on your solution or your platform right uh, because i'm pretty sure that pre covid time uh, you know your platform or your solution uh, did not expect that you know and and it's a good problem to solve but how did you solve it yeah so definitely no i i believe no one was prepared to, to such a, uh, an outbreak and um, what we have done basically is um, we have brainstormed, we have a small team of very bright uh, uh, developers and, and teammates. So when we actually brainstormed, uh, brainstormed and thought, okay, what can we do about this? And I guess uh, part of it was to just develop something that is uh, around the coronavirus or COVID. And um, I, we have, I believe, one of our great developers, he's, uh, he's with us today, uh, Hamad, who is uh, very, very bright and was able to develop that in three, four days. So we figured that, okay, this is a, a quick solution. Let's try it and then build on it. So we started with something super simple. 
and then we added on it. And given then uh, that uh, a lot of the other uh, panelists had mentioned before, uh, probably at this point, we're not looking for new clients. So we're not looking to sell our services uh, the, in the usual way. So we thought about a different way of doing it. So that was one of our, the, the ways that we, we dealt with is just creating something simple, something new, something that actually speaks to the current situation, something that reflects, let's say, the education material, the prevention measures, the home isolation rules, all these different small things um, that everyone needs to have on their phone, basically. And this is how we started. Uh, on another hand, basically, what we have done is um, our other uh, digital health solutions are mostly for diabetes. And we know that about, uh, I know there was a recent study that was uh, published end of, uh, end of March, that it was talking about 50% cancellation of appointments in the GCC. So this is uh, about, uh, they had 8 million uh, uh, client contacts fewer uh, per week. So this is a lot of people not being able to see their doctors to go to their diabetes appointment or to do any of it, knowing that these people are at a higher risk of getting seriously ill from COVID-19. So what we have done for these people is basically offered the services at a cheaper price, maybe a third of the price, so they can benefit from the services having a remote healthcare provider on the app through the Druby application uh, being able to help them. So I guess this is how in both ways we try to, um, to deal with the situation. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Tejinder, uh, and uh, it's a really long question, but I'll try to get you the crux of it. He says that, you know, he's been a big fan of your entrepreneurial journey, uh, you know, even from your, your businesses in India and now, you know, in Qatar. So, you know, like having had a successful venture in India and then moving to Qatar, uh, what do you see some of the similarities? You know, it, it's not easy to, uh, you know, build the level of success that you built with your successes in Qatar. So as someone who is not a local, uh, but, you know, you know, who believes that Qatar is a great uh, land of opportunity, uh, he wants to basically emulate, you know, uh, and follow your footsteps and have the level of success that you have achieved. So he's asking, what is the secret sauce? How did you do it? What are some of the things that you have to keep in mind to be successful in Qatar for someone who's not a local from in, uh, from Qatar? Okay, so uh, my question, the answer to my question, this question would be that uh, every market is different, Mosin, and. Uh, you know, you play uh, as per that market. So you cannot compare India with Qatar or Qatar with US and US with UK. All of these markets are different. They have different challenges. Uh, the key to success is that you, uh, when you land into a territory and you are coming to an, any territory, as a matter of fact, whether we are talking about Qatar or any, any territory in the world, uh, your first understanding should be about the territory, how the territory works, how the people are, how, uh, what exactly is missing, where are the problem areas, you know, what could be converted into opportunity, how much conversion cost it would take in terms of building an opportunity, you know, how much investment it would take. Is it, is it, uh, is it time consuming? Is it money consuming? Is it resource consuming? All of the factors you have to think, and then probably you have to uh, take your shot in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing this, but all the territories are different. Honestly speaking, there is no key to uh, what five steps, what Qatar would do and what you would do in India. It is like, you know, a famous saying is that you do, uh, uh, you know, when you're in Rome, do what Romans do. It's exactly like that. So, so you know, Qatar is totally a different market. It has its own uh, challenges. It has its own uh, plus points, uh, challenges, and you play according to that. So you play with the challenges, you play with the plus points. And I think in all, in all good faith, you should be through. Thank you. Um... Now, this is for uh, Taukir. Uh, he wants to be almost like a fortune teller, but uh, I'll let you take a crack at this one. It says, in the current situation of global crisis, uh, what is your opinion and how many months will it take for startups to raise capital? Uh, even if you don't want to give a direct answer, he's asking, okay, if a startup had planned for six months to raise uh, half a million or a million Qatari rial, what do you think now the startup entrepreneurs should be prepared for? You know, uh, from six months to now one year uh but anyways it's uh <laughs> yeah yeah it, it is uh, tough. <laughs> Throw the dice. i think it is a tough call to make uh but 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 the thing is that uh whenever there's an economic uh, recession such as this one uh then certainly uh, valuations uh research has shown that valuations do drop and there is a significant time lag uh, between fundraising rounds for startups so while uh, I think it'd be, it, it'd be, you know, 
uh, difficult to give an exact time frame. I think it entirely also depends on, on the kind of startup that's uh, looking for funding. If it falls in one of the buckets that is actually uh, benefiting from the COVID crisis or which has a minimal impact, uh, then I think it will be uh, somewhat easier for, for startups uh, in, in these fields to, to raise capital. Uh, but I think that otherwise, uh, uh, un unless uh, we, I think because, uh, you know, ultimately it's also the LP appetite, right? So LPs are now focused on existing portfolio companies uh, 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 and, uh, oh, sorry, GPs are focused on existing portfolio companies. And I think, uh, Fundraising is is uh, is uh, on the back burner right now. So uh, unable to give an exact time frame, but I think that uh, the, it will be delayed. But uh, I think there's this light at the end of the tunnel. This crisis won't last forever, and when we do see resurgence, then I think that uh, there will be plenty of liquidity to go around. Great. Uh, this question is for Uweda. Uh, they're intrigued by your name uh, of the organization Purple Box, uh, and what was the uh, stimulus of the aha moment uh, to starting the Purple Box? Uh, so, Oveda, if you can take that question, please. Sure. Is that, is that okay? Is the voice clear now? Hello? Yes, you're clear. Yes, yes, okay. you're clear. Okay. okay, thank you for the question. Yeah, Purple Box was, uh, I used to work for ICT Qatar, which was uh, the Ministry of uh, Information and Communication Technology. And one of the projects I was leading at that time was uh, developing the e-commerce uh, strategy uh, for the state of Qatar. Uh, and when I started working on the project for almost like uh, nine months, I realized that uh, definitely there is a huge opportunity for Qatar to have uh, a major e-commerce player in the country. So after that, uh, once I left the ministry, uh, we started, uh, a group of us uh, started sitting down and thinking, okay, what is really Qatar need uh, in terms of uh, e-commerce? And the main thing we, were thought of, we thought about that it needs a marketplace because in terms of the delivery, there are the companies who are handling it. There is the people who are the, the providers for the food ordering and so forth. But the marketplace for products, for items, uh, especially that uh, the development of uh, of website of online for most of the retailer in the country was very limited and we felt like we have very good niche uh, retailers they're very uh, well known with excellent brands but they were not really thinking about the online uh, side of, uh, of of retail so we felt like okay let's try it and hopefully we will develop purple box qatar once we manage uh, to understand all the needs of the customers in the country because Qatar is so small so you can really understand the, the whole supply chain of e-commerce from the customer retention to the engagement uh, to the satisfaction part. So that customer experience was our real focus. And we started completely different than the, the first session when uh, uh, Emma was talking about the product because we, we developed the website and the two apps, hybrid app, together at the same time. So we went to the whole process together. It was uh, a huge undertaking because we spent almost like nine months developing that uh, platform. Uh, and actually, it's not a great now because last year, if you ask me this question, I would say, yes, it was a mistake to start with the whole three platforms in one go. But now with uh, COVID-19, we find, no, it was a good uh, thing that we have done. It was a good investment because you have three platforms that you can direct the customers to. And at the same time, it can really take uh, a lot of the heat uh, which is required at, at this point. So Purple Box, the idea was something to grow from Qatar and hopefully you scale it uh, regionally. So that's how it came up to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aveda, for clarifying that. Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, he says, uh, I don't know whether it's he or she, but uh, the question is, um, I have never had my startup team work so much more efficiently and productive that I'm uh, that I do not know what will happen post COVID. Uh, so the, she's so they generally want ideas is that how do we maintain this newfound efficiency and productivity of the team members post COVID? This question to any panelists. 
Well, as long as there is a purpose, then definitely the team will be uh, surrounding it. The excitement with COVID is just like the same thing with the blocking. Uh, it is, uh, people are going to start to see results. They're going to see, uh, if it's a startup, they're going to start seeing revenues. So it will help them definitely to work together as a team. It will solidify their purpose. They will know that any idea, it is not about idea, about strategy, about planning. It's about working so hard, about enhancing, about making sure that your customers are engaged and they're pleased. And so this will help you to bring together. I'm actually having the same, the same issue. It's my team is working day and night, even Friday and Saturday, to make sure that the delivery are, is done on time, make sure that the customer are pleased, to make sure that when we scale, we scale with a purpose without getting uh, into the vanity of, uh, well, there's a lot of orders here, let's go ahead. No, it will help us to really streamline our processes, our technology, our people, and to make sure that whatever revenue is where it's coming, yes, right now, but this is not sustainable as well because it's an issue. But it means that we can grow. And so as long as there is that direction and purpose, which the whole team share, I think he can keep, he can keep the momentum. Yes, I actually second uh, Huwaida. Um, we, ha we had a meeting uh, a couple of days ago after delivering a big feature for Kobe. Um, and we were just thinking, okay, so what does that teach us? And I guess the, the lesson learned for everyone, for the whole team was that we can make anything uh, come to reality within four or five days. I mean, the whole team worked day and night on a, a whole new project to deliver five languages, create content, create graphics, uh, de uh, develop the app, uh, like do everything around it in four or five days. Like it was fully delivered functional in four or five days. So this was a huge for us. And I guess it makes the whole team realize that when we just uh, have a plan, decide on something, want to meet the deadline, they put their heart and soul into it and we can make anything uh, come uh, uh, real. So, I mean, that uh, puts new um, um, perspective into the expectation, I guess, post COVID-19. But as Huayda mentioned and everyone else uh, has mentioned, our teams are working day and night. The fact that we're working from home, it's almost as if we wake up, start working until we're gonna go back to bed because uh, like, it's just uh, uh, that whole uh, uh, setup that uh, we're working from home. Um, but definitely our team is very, very, very motivated knowing that anything could be, could, uh, could happen uh, uh, in the next few uh, months. So Rasha, basically, if you see, if you see here that it brought you into a startup life cycle again, isn't it? This time. Yes. Yes. So that is the essence. So basically what I, I my message to everyone would be that, uh, don't go away from a startup mindset you know what happens in the general in the in the in the growth of an organization is that we grow a product and then the product becomes successful in an organization everybody sticks to it because now yes. everybody feels right from top to bottom is that we are successful the product is known in the market and suddenly we forget we leave we go away from the startup mindset i think living with a startup mindset keep finding new ideas keep evolving seeing the opportunities keep building something new is the essence as it's it's always it's always true it's always uh, you know a fact that you have to live with now working at home is something that probably a startup would have done when it doesn't have a money they all four or five co-founders are working from the home and suddenly you all we all are in the covid times again in that same uh, you know uh, ecosystem so i think this is uh, what should always exist you know when you're always in a startup mindset you're always looking for an opportunity, you know, beside building the uh, brands that you have already built, uh, you know, in the startup mode. And that is very, very important. That's what I feel is, uh, should be uh, for the, for the person that who has asked the question that how he or she keeps the team motivated, keep them in a startup mode, keep them in a mode, in a mindset where they're always looking for the opportunity. They're always looking for something that's going to be exciting, something they have made, something they can build on. Even if it is with the existing product, there could be value at services, there could be enhancement of the current product, but keep the startup mind on. That's the most important thing. Yes, and I guess if I can just add to you, Doctor, is just taking the risk. I mean, it was just a risk that no one will use this app, but we just figured, okay, four or five days worth of work, we're going to have something ready. If people choose to use it, great. If it gets the support, great. I mean, we'll do our best to make it uh, reach the people to get the support needed, but we actually took the risk because no one asked us to do it. We decided to do it. So that risk that was taken around it was uh, also something that uh, brings a little bit of that adrenaline rush to, to the whole team. We're building something that we don't know if anyone is going to use it or not, but uh, uh, yes, that 
that whole risk uh, uh, taking is something uh, also that probably should be uh, considered. Thank you so much, Roger. And uh, you know, as uh, as the uh, concluding remarks, Doc, here, I will hear it from you. I think I'll just agree with. Uh, I think uh, these people are actually running startups, and they are really, you know, uh, knowledgeable about keeping uh, their teams motivated and productive. So I think for me also, it's it's uh, it's been uh, working around the clock in in these times, and productivity has actually increased. And I think that is is in line with most of the research being conducted around the world before COVID happened. I mean, in France, they did a three, uh, four day working week productivity increase. I mean, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, and again, it's a, it's a paradigm shift. So I think, uh, I know, uh, we never know, you know, maybe this uh, could eventually turn out to be the new norm. Yeah. Well, if uh, productivity, efficiency, uh, new opportunities uh, is the new normal, I think, you know, uh, you're seeing a lot of you know hope in the midst of another you know, crisis. I think you know that's that's how crisis should you know that's that's why I think humans should make out of any crisis. You know, it's a, it's 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 a new set of opportunities, new set of partners, new set of people, new set of good habits. You know, so uh, it's time to kind of like you know uh, go through uh, an upgrade. <laughs> Since we're all in the tech world, you know, I think uh, the humans got a new upgrade. Uh, you know, post COVID. But uh, for the wonderful panelists, I couldn't have you know. Uh, I couldn't thank you guys enough for, you know, uh, uh, Racha, Ume, Umeda, Dr. Tejender, Taki, thank you so much for your thoughts, for your time, uh, and also for championing, uh, you know, the Qatar startup ecosystem and your entrepreneurship culture there. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure, uh, you know, just hosting this and I feel a lot privileged. So thank you everybody.